tough times for the dairying people, but not that great for cropping farmers either. Yes, Rob. Well, um, cropping farmers at the moment are a bit like the old dairy farmers used to be when they changed from the cream can to the uh, to the stainless steel. They had a choice of uh, whether they invest in the stainless steel or um, get out of dairying. And uh, I've had farmers say to me, this compliance cost and the things that we have to do just to carry on farming is, uh, is not on for me. I'm out of it. Sell the farm. Gone. And that's happening right now? It's happening right now. I found out about one this morning who said it two weeks ago and now his land's on the, on the market and I know a guy's going to buy it. And uh, it's a young guy and he'll buy into all this stuff and it'll be part and parcel of his world. But it's certainly not part and parcel of the farmer who's selling. The, uh, we're grey-headed chaps. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, so basically, what, what are the stumbling blocks, Dennis? Well, the issues really, Rob, are, are what farmers have to do to stay compliant, um, to stay in the business, so that the customers we do have will actually buy our produce. And so I guess it's being madly driven by the environmentalists and the, at the customer end and saying, you know, uh, we want the best in the world in terms of uh, food safety and traceability, but we're not really prepared to pay for what it costs to get that. And so that is the, that is the problem. And the problem is, is the, the education required around farmers to be able to, to actually fill these things in um, so that they can be audited and that they can be um, compliant. And, and this auditing thing and, and, and the requirements, the, the rush, the headlong rush to actually get all this done is just crazy. And, and um, you know, the amount of inspectors, the amount of uh, auditors that are going to be required. Um, you and I were talking earlier about, you know, what's going to happen with the fertiliser industry and can they handle it within the time frame? Well, the answer is no. The answer is definitely no. And, uh, for instance, um, our farm is, is in a phosphate uh, runoff area. And so by January 2016, we actually have to apply for a resource con consent to carry on farming. Now that is, that is just crazy, you know, give us time to, to, to understand the problem, to take some steps to mitigate it. In fact, if we can mitigate those problems that potentially are happening there. But, uh, you know, I've numbered off 11 different compliances and, and uh, things that farmers have to do to stay in the in the game and um, some of them are um, you know uh, people like Foundation for Arable Research are putting on um, workshops and things like that to try and bring farmers up to speed but I guess there'll be less than 50 percent of those uh, cropping farmers who actually will attend those types of things. Um, Why is that? Because they don't want or they just think it's all too hard? It's all too hard. They're too busy actually farming and they, they just think, well, um, it's not necessary. But I think there'll be some doors start slamming shut fairly soon. We're being forced to comply with these sorts of things. And, you know, even like um, it's no longer um, acceptable to be uh, just, a, just an irrigator and potentially waste water. Our irrigators will probably be we're forced to do variable rate irrigation. So. Um, some of them can do a rudimentary job now by, by speeding up or slowing down, mm -hmm. but there'll be areas in, in, in fields and paddocks where um, some of the soil type is different, uh, might be a bit of a wet area. Well, those irrigators will have to be sophisticated to the point where they, they, they don't put as much water on those gullies or things like that. And, you know, the science is there, but it goes with a cost. And, 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 and yeah. basically, you're just being told what to do. You you can't sort of say, well, yep, yeah, I've been irrigating in this with this unit, this rotor rainer for the last however long. Sure, sure. Well, it's pretty black and white what is required and not required to be able to get up to speed, to gear up to speed, to buy the specific equipment to comply. Is the problem, and and then actually the, there has to be at the end of the day of it, at the end of the day. It has to be viable, it has to be financially viable to, to do all this and not just get clever toys that uh, appease somebody else. Uh, clever toys that don't cost too much or, or have some savings so that you can continue farming um, viably. And, you know, we could, we could invest in all of this and sort of do ourselves out of a job and say, well, you know, 
no, I can't run that many sheep because they, they poo too much, <laughs> cows or they wee too much. Um, can't do that anymore, so what are we going to do? We'll get backed into a corner where um, the options are, um, are just not there. It's, I mean, it, it, it's a no-win situation. If, if it's costing you more than it is to farm, that for, as far as returns are concerned, I mean, cropping now is in the same light as dairying. Yes, well, but you for know, a different reason. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, you could you could fill your farm with barley now, <clears throat> and grow barley, and go broke. Even with top yields, you go broke. So we can't afford to do that. We've got to cherry pick uh, more valuable crops because our land's so expensive. Um, the inputs are higher. The management skills are higher. There's just going to be this real lift in what's required and. You know, some of our buyers are, are multinationals and they don't care if they find a plant growth regulator in, in traces of wheat or barley or something that they just throw their arms in the air and say New Zealand's worse than the rest of the world. You're not going to use that again. Then an all-west wind comes along, the barley hasn't uh, been sprayed with a, um, a plant growth regulator to control um, ear break, neck break, and half the crop's on the ground. So work your way around that one. There, there is no other choice than that particular product and, and those levels that have been found are actually below the um, requirements of the international market. But they still say there's some there so they throw their arms in the air and say exactly. no cancel, cancel New Zealand. Exactly, exactly. So that's the sort of reactionary thing that, that, that New Zealand farmers are against. You know, The customer's always right, the customer's whim, uh, the companies in between don't quite understand uh, how it all works or, or doesn't work or why we use it, you know. It's an expensive thing to do and, and the, the timing has to be right. Um, so why would we want to use it? We use it to mitigate risk and that's what it's all about. Phew, I mean, this, we got through the DDT thing <laughs> and now there's this ugly looking head coming back up. <laughs> it is, it is. We did manage the DDT t thing and that was, you know, um, mixing the soil up and diluting it amongst what was happening there or <coughs> finding it in the first milking of the heifers, so, so, yeah. so dumping that milk and things like that. These are clever things that New Zealand farmers are capable of adapting to, but some of them, and because they're compounding, uh, some farmers just had enough. Dennis, thank you very much indeed.